So this talk is called Before the Maya, the Olmec, Quetzalcoatl, and the megalithic origins of Central America. And this is based on a trip I did there uh, this year, uh, and, and uh, late last year. Uh, I travel around Mexico, Guatemala, uh, Honduras, and Belize, exploring all the sites really that were before the Maya. So we're not gonna look at really any Mayan stuff today, although that is what's recognized really as the main sort of hub of ancient sites in Central America. But there's a lot more to that than you might imagine. For example, there's pyramids near Mexico City that are supposed to be over 7,000 years old. There's strange statues reminiscent of those at Tiwanaku in Bolivia, which are believed now to be thousands of years old. There's huge megaliths at places like Monte Alban and Mitla around Oaxaca. And the Olmecs, who were spread along the Gulf Coast, they go back at least to 2000 BC. And they were of huge megalithic kind of structures and colossal heads that they were carving back then. Some as good, if not as, as, as better than some of the Egyptian carving. And so even the stelae at some of these Mayan sites, which are well known, they look, they just, to me, they just look like megaliths. And they're just standing around at all these pyramid sites. But there's evidence now that they were around before the Maya too, and the sites were built around them. And there's obviously, as you go into Belize, there's places called Lubantu and Nimli Punit. And these are of megalithic structure as well. They're not classic pyramid sites of the Maya. And there's even the story of the crystal skull uh, at, at, um, at Lubantu there as well. And when you look into this and you sort of go beyond and before the Mayan era, you find that it wasn't the Maya who even invented the so-called Mayan calendar or the long count calendar, which is famous for its end date in 2012. What has now been realized is that the Olmecs along the Gulf Coast, about one and a half thousand to 2000 BC, originated the Mayan calendar and were fully aware of the end date in 2012. So this is just some of the classic pictures of the Maya and the Aztec, which are the later cultures of that part of the world, and some of the codexes. And this is the area that I explored. It was really the central area here, which kind of interested me, going up to Mexico City. I didn't really go to the Yucatan, because I went there six, six or seven years ago and explored the area then. Um, so I won't be talking about any of the Mayan sites in that area, but it's mainly from Mexico City, through Oaxaca, Gulf Coast, down into southern Guatemala and Belize. And this is um, some of the sites just shown on here. This is Teotihuacan in Mexico City. In fact, Mexico City, before it was developed into a major the central city in Mexico, it was actually a huge kind of lake city. And they built Tenochtitlan, which is a later Aztec site, actually within the lake and, on sort of a, and around it. Um, but there's a place called uh, Quilquilco, which is just south of Mexico. You can actually get there on the subway uh, from the center. And it's a 7,000-year-old site. And uh, we'll be having a look at that shortly. And this is one of the most interesting datings of the sites that we get in Central America. But before that, we really need to look at the legend of Quetzalcoatl, or Quetzalcoatl, as it's sometimes pronounced, which in the Mayan tongue, or the Aztec's tongue, means the plumed serpent, or the rainbow serpent in some other traditions. And the legends around him are very interesting because they, go, they definitely go back to the Olmec times now, they've realized they're not early Mayan or Aztec, although the Aztecs and the Mayans both revered him as the, one of their gods, as their main god, in fact. And um, he was said as a legendary figure to have turned up on the Gulf Coast with his band of followers. He was a tall white man, as can be seen in this picture here, looking a bit like Jesus. Uh, with, he was bearded, he had long hair, he had flowing robes and sandals. <clears throat> he taught the arts of agriculture, of peaceful, uh, peaceful communication between tribes. And also he taught the arts of megalithic construction, marriage, how to grow food, and, and all these different higher qualities. He even said to have taught the art of writing and, uh, and to develop languages that they could all understand. So he was like a really high level kind of figure who turned up there and taught, and he's had such an influence on the cultures there that it lasted for several thousand years. Although the origins of Quetzalcoatl are still shrouded in mystery, as they don't know if he was an actual person or if it's just a legendary kind of myth that they've kind of developed it from. Although the evidence suggests that he really was a person and he did come over. Because when you look at South America, we find the exact same legends and the exact same descriptions for Viracocha, 
along uh, late, around Lake Titicaca in Bolivia and Peru. And I visited there a couple of years ago and explored all the myths and legends there. And they're still going strong today, as they are in Central America. Now, Quetzalcoatl, uh, although he wasn't mentioned <coughs> in any Olmec literature, basically because there isn't any, there's only stones left to decipher their culture from. There's, uh, in the Olmec culture, we find evidence of uh, lots of carvings with Caucasian or white people with beards and wearing long robes. And so we, we have a feeling and, and speculation that the Olmecs were certainly, it was certainly around before then. There was actually a, uh, a leader of uh, the Toltec peoples in the 10th century, uh, which they think it was around Tula, and he was actually called Quetzalcoatl, and the stories around him have sort of been copied from the older myths, uh, and, it got, and it's kind of got mixed up, because now everyone believes Quetzalcoatl was just this 10th century Toltec king, which, which they realize now that can't be the case, because the legends definitely go way back before then. So I just wanted to introduce you to Quetzalcoatl, and then we'll look at him, and we'll see evidence of him in other sites as we move through the different areas of Central America. Uh, in Tepotzlan, which is um, just south, 60 miles south of Mexico City, uh, this is the temple of Quetzalcoatl, and is said to have been his birthplace. Now we think, and, and the, the researchers and archaeologists think, this was actually the 10th century Quetzalcoatl. But I just wanted to show you this, because this is the most amazing town. It's like the Glastonbury of, uh, of Mexico. It's the hippie town. It's the artist town. It's the town where all the alternative thinkers live. I spent a few days here and had a beautiful time there. And you have to walk all the way up this kind of whole hilltop mountain to get to the small pyramid temple up there. So this is said to be the birthplace, and he was born there some 1,200 years ago, according uh, to legend. So if we move slightly, I think, southwest of um, Mexico City, but still in, the, still in the confines of Mexico City, El Quilco, which is a very strange uh, circular pyramid, which is interesting to me because the lava flow that was said to have been discovered over it was analysed by carbon dating, and the first test they did on it back in the 1920s, I think, was said to be over 7,000 years old. And so this kind of threw all the archaeologists and the Mayanists into chaos, and they couldn't cope with this kind of dating. Um, and that, so they retested it, and even the retest they did uh, sev several years later, it still went to 2000 BC. And so, and e but even now, Quilquilco is only uh, recognised as being about 10 AD, still in the sort of, uh, sort of early Mayan era. And so there's a big problem with that, because uh, they're basically just fixing their dates as they see fit to fit in with the current paradigm. And this date kind of, this dating kind of problem, it happens throughout Central America, as it does probably throughout the world, as we will probably see at this conference. And so this really intrigued me, because if you look on the left here, there's this strange little symbol, which you've probably seen at Newgrange, and you've probably seen uh, in other places. Even at Tiwanaku in Bolivia, this symbol is, is, is uh, I've photographed it there. Uh, it's, it's found all around the world, and uh, according to some people, it's uh, related to uh, telluric energies. Others say it's related to the, the way the sun moves and the shadow of a stick moves through archaeoastronomy. It creates this kind of shape. So, but it's, this is it's found in so many places around the world that it just intrigued me that it was found at Quilquilco, potentially the oldest uh, site in Central America. In fact, when the archaeologists first uh, opened up Quilquilco, they uh, saw a blue light appear above the pyramid. And they got all excited because they thought they may find treasure there. Uh, so they dug in, ruined the whole thing, and there was nothing there, unfortunately, for them. So the next, one of the other places we visited was Tula. And there's just a couple of interesting things here uh, that grabbed me. The fact that these are images of what looks like Quetzalcoatl, not really with the beard, but certainly with the feathers and the plumes. And these look remarkably similar to uh, the, the structure, uh, to the statues in Tiwanaku in Bolivia, as you can see here. And the similarities are quite incredible, and they're, they're pretty much the same size, same kind of construction, same kind of stonework. And, um, and we'll find more similarities with South America as we move through this talk. These strange things, very interesting, said to be incense bags, but if you look carefully, they look more like plasma guns, if you know what they are. Um, in, my, in Toltec legend, there's this word, which I can't pronounce, uh, but it, it translates as fire serpents. And, these, and this is, these are said to be, this is what Graham Hancock mentioned in Fingerprint of the Gods as well, is that it was something, as a legend, so they could cut through people's bodies with it, and it was used for decapitation. 
which is nice. Um, but also, it was they think it could have been powerful enough to use to cut and shape and carve stone. And this may have been the technique that the ancients were using in this part of the world. And there's a lot of unusual kind of stories about that that I've, I've sort of discovered that kind of uh, back this theory up. And this is on the back, you know, this is on the back part. Um, it's kind of on the back part, sort of around here, around the belly button kind of area. You get this strange face as well. And just outside uh, the front of Tula uh, um, is a very interesting selection of what looks like megaliths. And this kind of, you know, got me being a megalithomaniac. Uh, and it just looked like a sort of remnants of a stone circle. I mean, if, if we found this in England, it would be registered and recorded as a stone circle and probably get on OS maps. But because it's just outside the front in the car park at Tula, it doesn't get that kind of recognition. And all the pyramid sites and the Toltec statues uh, take over, uh, take the credit. But, this, but if you look, you know, I took quite a few photos of this, and it just looked like it was the remnants of a stone circle. And this, and so this intrigued me immediately because I'd heard stories that perhaps some of the some of these sites were originally megalithic sites that were then developed later into pyramid sites and later Mayan sites. So we'll see more of this kind of evidence as we move through this talk. Uh, in Teotihuacan, I'm just going to quickly have a, have a look at this. This isn't a Mayan site. They're not sure who even lived there, who even built it. It's a real mystery shrouded around that. The dating on it's a bit controversial. Some people say it's many thousands of years old. The archaeologists say it's like 1,000 or 1,500 years old, depending on who you ask. But at the end of the, 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 end of the lane, going down the main lane at Teotihuacan, is the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl, which intrigued me. Because you can see, again, the plumed serpent here, and also here, a close-up photo of some of the structures around it. And right in the middle of the, um, right in the middle of the whole complex at Teotihuacan, just over the, this is the Pyramid of the Moon in the background. Uh, in front of it, which no one has mentioned, I've never seen a photograph of it, is a huge monolith, um, and so and it's, it's virtually in the centre of that area. Uh, around the Moon Pyramid and near the Sun Pyramid, and all the temples and smaller temples are built around it. And so why that hasn't been noticed, I'm not sure. But they put, they put a little fence around it, so they must have thought it had some importance. And here as well, this is um, an Olme, what looks like an Olmec face, or an Olmec jade mask that was in the museum at Teotihuacan. And there's suggestions that the Olmecs may have even been responsible for the construction of Teotihuacan. But that's just speculation at the moment, as there's no evidence. It's just a view from... Uh, the Pyramid of the Moon, looking over to the Pyramid of the Sun. And that's me sitting there. Um, and you can see how, you know, this happens a lot in megalithic sites, but also at pyramid sites around the world, how the, the shapes of the hill seem to sort of mirror the shape of the actual structures themselves. And it's just down here, just past there, is where that megalith is that we just looked at in the previous slide. So there's a lot, a lot to say about Teotihuacan. There's underground tunnels going under the Pyramid of the Sun. There's a few megaliths um, along the side of the Pyramid of the Sun here. Um, there's a lot of strange stories. There's lots, it's, it, the placement of it in relation to other sites in Mexico is very interesting, uh, which I'm happy to chat with people about afterwards. It's quite complicated. Uh, a geodetic survey that seemed to be, to be done over Central America in prehistory. Um, but the next site we went to look at is Cholula, which surprisingly for many people, and many people find this quite shocking when they're told this, this is actually the largest pyramid ever built in the world. Uh, and you can see that it's pretty big. This is just the sort of front bit here. And these are people here. You can see the sheer site, and it looked all like this all the way around apparently. A huge great thing. Um, but the problem with this one is, is that when Hern, Hernan Cortes and his, his band of followers turned up in 1519 um, <clears throat> to pretty much behead the Aztec Empire, um, they came to Cholula, and this was, a, this was a site dedicated to Quetzalcoatl. It was actually built in his honour, according to legend. And uh, it's 45 acres, has a height of 210 feet. It makes it's about twice, three times the size of the Giza Pyramid and about twice the size of the Bosnian pyramid. And so we're looking at quite a big structure. And the sheer man hours it must have taken to construct such a, such a pyramid is not even worth considering. Um, but you, again, there's evidence that the Olmecs were here as well. So we're looking at a potential Olmec site uh, here. Um, this is um, some a strange kind of Olmec oid head which is around one side of the pyramid. We've got these megaliths just popping up everywhere, and there's this kind of face. 
So as, as we get into the Gulf, uh, the Gulf um, area, we'll still see lots of these old mech heads, there's 17 of them in total. But because Hernan Cortes turned up, um, the same similar thing happened in, in South America. Um, all the people there believed he was the return of Quetzalcoatl. He was a white man with a beard, a band of followers. He came at the same year. Quetzalcoatl promised to come back in and all these kind of things. So they greeted him like he was their god and he got treated as such. So he took huge advantage of that and managed to overthrow the whole Aztec empire within a, within a decade. And so we see that these legends were strong then, you know, even up to the 1500s, the legends of Quetzalcoatl were still very strong and they were still reminiscent um, throughout the many years uh, of history before that. Also at Cholula, we have this very strange megalith outside the front of the main steps we looked at previously. And you can see it's got a sort of, um, you know, this bit here is a little bit like Stonehenge to me. Also, it's got a hole in it, perfectly cut. Reminds me of the stonework in Peru uh, and Bolivia. I mean, this is just standing here. It's not, it doesn't have any fitting with the rest of the structure. But again, it's evidence of a, a potential megalithic kind of um, culture that were there before the Toltecs, the Maya, and the other cultures. This just shows you a picture from the museum, uh, how it, the, the complete sort of structure and how big it was. This is an old wood carving. If you head further east, uh, out of Mexico City towards Oaxaca, just before you reach Oaxaca, you reach a place called Monte Alban. And this is a fascinating place. Um, it's a Zapotec site, and they were around before the Maya, maybe 500 BC. The official dating of this site is 500 BC. Um, but there's evidence that there was, there was stuff going on there much, much earlier. And we can see this huge megalith here. It was an astronomical megalith that measured, measured the sort of sun zenith over that, that, over that latitude of Central America. And it's been tested and recorded and it does work as such. These are the strange kind of dancers that the archaeologists call these megaliths that are around the back end of the site. And we'll just have a look at some of those because, strangely, these look like Olmecs. Because, as we'll find out shortly, the Olmecs were said to be of Negroid origin, of African origin, a very sort of Nubian or Western African faces, which has caused a, a big problem for the Mayanists and the archaeologists. And we see that here at uh, Monte Alburn. But also on some of these, these carvings, we see what appears to be white people with beards which doesn't make any sense because no one in Central America, the natives especially, they don't grow facial hair. And so we're looking at from like up for 500 BC, potentially to 1500 BC, a culture with beards, which must have traveled and come into that country from another place. And you can see these structures that were built by the later Zapotecs incorporated these stones into their structures. And, they, and, and if you go to the site itself, you can see that the, some of the, these, these kind of things here are actually placed in the corners of the later Zapotec pyramids. So although that isn't mentioned in any of the official uh, literature on the site or in any of the archeology span books, you go there for yourself and you can see it with your own eyes. As you head out to the car park, uh, you find this huge megalithic trilithon, which isn't even mentioned. Again, it's a bit like the little stone circle outside of Tula. You can see the size of this. I mean, I, that's about, I stood to about that height there. And so we're looking at something not as big as Stonehenge, but certainly as impressive when you compare it to other megalithic, megalithic sites in Central America. These is, this is like one sol solid block. That's a solid block. And there's two more of these around the, around the other side as well. And this is just in the back of the car park. Um, so I thought I'd make a big deal of it, even if they don't. Uh, but if you head through Oaxaca and carry on heading east, um, you get to a place called Mitla, which is, has a very similar kind of megalithic lintel structure. And the underlying structure of this whole site is, is, is remarkable. Uh, it's famous for its mosaic stonework, uh, which we'll have a look at in a moment. But it's these here which really interested me because there's probably about 30 of these sort of lintels over doorways. And mostly these, uh, not necessarily on this one, but mostly these are solid chunks of stone as well. And then we get these huge megalithic columns you know, carved out of solid basalt. And these come from 12 miles away and the quarry has already been found. So we know that they were, they knew how to construct in a megalithic way. So whether that was one of the arts and sciences that Quetzalcoatl and his followers brought over and it's still there because these are such large megalithic structures. And then later the Mayans, the Zapotecs and the Toltecs developed and built over that. That's the speculation, that's the theory that I'm trying to sort of piece together. These are some other photos from Mitla. 
Uh, we can see here the megalithic columns is another area. This is the main temple area. Uh, although it's clearly stated by archaeologists that there are no columns in Central America, you can see them quite clearly there. I can see them. I went there. These are the uh, famous mosaics that are throughout. There's quite a few of these in Mitla. It's very famous for that. The Zapotecs were incredible stonemasons. This just shows you the sort of size of uh, the stone that just fell over that we're talking about. I thought I'd have, get a photo of a little girl standing there to make it look even bigger. Um, and this is the main temple area, which these are within, and that is within. It's definitely worth a visit, Mitla. It's an incredible site. It's beautiful energy there as well, and you can spend a whole day there. Uh, driving back in my little tuk-tuk down the road, basically a, a bike with a sort of a seat on the back. Uh, driving back to the bus stop, I spotted this. Just over, I looked over a wall and suddenly there was a whole megalithic temple there. Um, it's just derelict and there was kids playing football in it. Um, which kind of interested me because you can see, again, you can see the sort of shaping of the stone to fit them together. Can't really see it on the back ones, but there. I noticed that on a few of these stones. So we're looking at sort of Tiwanaku, Bolivia style stonework, Stonehenge style stonework. This is again, this is back in the main Mittler site. It just shows you the size of the lintels. There's a sort of slightly fisheye lens that caused that, um, caused that illusion. It's actually flat and straight. And the beautiful cut stonework, there's no mortar. It's perfectly pieced together like you get in, Central, like you get in South America. Now we're going to move swiftly into the Gulf uh, area region, the Gulf of Mexico. It's all this region here we're looking at, and, and we're going to move into the Olmec sites from uh, Mitla there. I sort of went north, well, after spending a few days on the beach down there, of course, uh, and went up north here to the Olmec sites. First of all, I went to Jalapa Museum, uh, which is just, in north, um, just north of Veracruz City. And these are two of the major Olmec heads. You've probably seen these in photographs and books and, and, and things before. Um, 17 of these have been discovered in total. Uh, they've got about, I think, nine or ten on display at Jalapa Museum. Some people say they look a bit like me, but I don't really want to comment on that. <laughs> and there's another one that's in the garden. I'm just going to have to flick through this because there's a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of photos I took, so I'm going to move quite swiftly. But you can see the clearly negroid features, big lips, wide nose, chubby face, funny helmet as well. But this happens through every single one of these Olmec heads is like that. They're all frowning as well. So this is why uh, they say it looks like me. Um, <laughs> this is one that's nearly smiling. It's getting there. Uh, but you can see, again, this looks like it's been deliberately damaged. And this is something that happened with a lot of these Olmec heads. They were deliberately damaged at a later period. Because these basically date from 1500 BC to 1800 BC. Most of the ones here were found at San, San Lorenzo. Some were found at La Venta, but we'll look at the La Venta ones soon. Some were at Tres Zapotes, and there's a few other sites. It's mainly San Lorenzo was like the capital. And on the back here, you get these strange seven feathers. To me, they're a symbol of Quetzalcoatl. Here's some more heads. This one's completely battered. This one's actually smiling. It's the only one out of 17. So um, this one's not smiling so much. He's been quite destroyed. Uh, but again, you can see the features. Clearly, that's not native Central American. And these are the 17 heads that have been discovered. This one we'll look at shortly. This is the biggest one. It's the 40-ton one. And it's known that these were moved about 50, 10 to 15 miles from uh, the mountains at the uh, south or south of San Lorenzo, the ones from San Lorenzo anyway. And and they've got no idea how they moved. And there was a hilarious uh, BBC documentary that went over to uh, this area to try and move an equally large piece of basalt from the mountains there using primitive techniques. And another guy trying to carve one of these heads using the tools that they would have used then. And it was the most enjoyable program I've ever seen and how they failed so miserably to even move a stone a few yards and they, with 100 people. They ended up using cranes. And, and how they couldn't carve the stone from this sort of top college professor. And he was so humiliated, he went home halfway through the program. So that's what I might have to show that another year. Uh, it's thoroughly enjoyable. And this is, uh, again, this is a lap of museum. This is, an, this is some of the classic stonework you get of the Olmecs. You get this crouched position. This comes up a lot. Uh, you get these huge altars, which are kind of this big, maybe 10 feet wide. Solid basalt again, carved beautifully. This is obviously worn. And these strange zoomorph, anamorph figures, crouched Egyptian-looking childlike figure. These keep turning up. 
and we get the elongated skull. Uh, this is actually from uh, Halapa Museum. And this is the same thing as we saw yesterday, that this is one from Nazca that I took a couple of years ago. And so we're seeing the same kind of elongated skull kind of uh, culture in Central America as you get in South America. And so again, we're seeing that the connections keep turning up. There's a suggestion that the Olmecs were either met, they actually went down to South America through the whole of Central America and actually met up with these people to learn the techniques. But this is again, this is just speculation. This is the strange turtle, I just really liked him. So I thought I'd show you that. So we move now slightly further east from Jalapa. Uh, past Veracruz town to a place called Santiago, Santiago Tuxla. And in the plaza there, we have this head. This is the biggest one they've ever found. It's 40 tons. It's the only one with closed eyes. They're not sure why. Uh, and these are in the little museum there. And again, you can see the clearly negroid features. This has been, you know, analysed by lots of different people. Uh, and you can see the sort of cool, funky sort of 50s haircut as well on both of them. <laughs> And this is in the museum there again, yet another Olmec head. And this is very interesting because it's got seven braids on the back. This has been analysed by some researchers in, uh, in, in Western Africa and they, use, they do exactly the same technique there uh, that has been known about uh, a few hundred BC. And so this, they, they're realising there is a con possible connection with this sort of style here. You see the great big kind of axe-like earring. And these are some of the mounds, although this was just in the museum, you can't go there anymore. These are some of the mounds uh, around the back of Tres, near Tres Sepotes, which we're going to have a look at in a moment. And they were basically a, like a mound culture, a bit like uh, North America and a bit like in Britain. And they used earth as their main building construction. But there is evidence they were using stone too in some places where they could. But because the, the Gulf Coast doesn't have a great deal of it, because of the tro tropical climate, they did use earth a lot, but a lot of it's obviously been destroyed now because of the very, very hot, humid tropical climate. I'll take, take questions at the end, that's okay. Uh, and this is um, another old mech head. This is actually in Tres Zapotes, and you can get a bus straight there from uh, Santiago Tuxla. Uh, it's not easy to get to these Olmec sites if you do if you do travel in this part of the, uh, this part of Central America, but you can do it. And following on from Paul Devereux's work yesterday, this is very interesting. St some of the stones in Tres Zapotes are acoustically built and designed. This is a big. This is actually quite a big construction that kind of goes around like this. It's pretty big. It kind of goes. You know, it's probably about ten feet wide in like a circular kind of hoop. Yeah, and this is where they meet again, but they've obviously cut it here because that's got a different tone to that one. I, I did record it on my camera, but I, I can't show you it here. And again, this is a very strange sort of anamorph figure. A lot of them have these square bits going off the back as though they were placed within walls. And this is, you get this at Tiwanaku in Bolivia, exactly the same kind of um, design and style. This is uh, the famous Long Count Calendar Stone found at Tres Zapotes. This really, really annoyed uh, the Mayanists when this was discovered. Uh, back in the 1950s, um, and it's, it's one of the earliest dates that have ever been recorded in the Mayan calendar. Uh, before that, the earliest Mayan, before this was discovered, uh, the earliest Mayan date was 228, was two, uh, sorry, let me just get this, let me just get this. Uh, the earliest Mayan date was about 100 or 120 AD. So when Matthew Sterling, uh, the archeologist, uncovered this in the 1950s and found a long count date, which goes back to 31 BC, the, the, Mayan, the Mayanists and the academics went into shock and they couldn't cope with the fact that all the research and academic books they'd written about the Mayans saying they, they, it was the Mayan calendar and all this kind of stuff had been completely destroyed in one foul swoop by Matthew Sterling and his discovery of this particular stone at Tres Zapotes, which has a 31 BC calendar date. Uh, I'm not going to have a chance to get thoroughly into this whole calendar issue here, uh, but Jeff Stray is probably around and he can sort of fill you in on, on some of the details and I can have a chat afterwards about the finer details of this. But there's been other calendar dates as well, which have been found on stones. This is just an analysis of that particular stone. This is what's on the other side of the stone, a very strange guy with a sort of, uh, sort of chest thing he's wearing, and I can't really work out what the rest of it means. Um, but in Chapa de Corzo, for instance, which is a lot, quite a bit further south, uh, another cycle, so it's called, what's called Cycle 7 Dates, which is uh, you know, about 100 or so BC, uh, which is here, and we're up there at the moment here. Uh, yet another calendar date has been found and this has been analysed by Jeff Stray um, and these are some of the things he came, some of the dates he came up with. Now if we're talking about the Olmecs this date kind of fits but because part of the stone's missing we can't 
finalise and fix the day, which is just the nature of the way these calendar, these dot and bar systems work. So these are the possible ones. That's the ones that the academics have gone for. This is the one I like because it fits in with the Olmecs, the Olmec period perfectly. And this is the kind of time they would have been developing the calendar because it's quite well known so you're aware of this, that the long count or the 13 Bacton cycle calendar began in 3114 BC and ends in December the 21st, 2012. And so this intrigues me because there's, there's not any known culture apart from possibly Quetzalcoatl and his people and Quilquilco that go anywhere near that date. Um, and so who was around to start the calendar in 3114 BC? My money's on Quetzalcoatl, and he was the one who influenced the Olmecs when they turned up around 2000 BC, and then they developed the calendar that he'd started. Again, this is speculation. They could have, in some traditions in the, in the Mayan calendar systems anyway, they backdate their calendars to cover epochs of time they want to have power or control over. Lots more to this than that. This is just a brief um, uh, sort of plethora of ideas. Uh, but there's much older dates than that possibilities with this Chapa de Corzo one. So it's just, uh, it's just interesting to note that although the Mayans developed the calendar and turned it into this hugely sophisticated masterwork of multiple calendars, it looks like the Olmecs were the ones who kind of you know, got the first uh, inkling of the date sorted out. They also had the Harb calendar, which is the 365-day solar year calendar. And there's evidence now that they even had the 260-day uh, Zolkin count as well, which is the sacred calendar. Um, but we can talk, uh, have a little chat about that afterwards if anyone wants to get into numbers. Um, this is another one, which is quite interesting, 156 AD. Although it's a bit later, it's yet another very early, one of the earlier dates of the calendar of La Majora. Anyway, so we go, if we move um, slightly east from Teresa Potes to San Lorenzo, uh, this is one of the, the most important Olmec sites. There's not many left anyway, and most of the sites have been completely destroyed, apart from Laventa, which we'll have a look at shortly. This is one of the most recently discovered Olmec heads. It was discovered in the 1980s. It was actually found in a swamp, and someone got really freaked out when they were on their boat on the swamp, and they saw this massive head looking at them because it was facing upwards, and it's like, oh my God, what's that? And then this strange stone spheres as well. Uh, this is, uh, these are very similar to the ones you obviously find in Costa Rica, and also in Bosnia, uh, around uh, the Great Pyramids in Bosnia too. There's some other carvings from San Lorenzo, this very strange uh, sort of black uh, basalt super rock on the right here. Uh, mutilated faces on the left. The top right, we've got what looks like a Caucasian uh, fella crouched and sort of hugging a stone. It's a bit like some of us do in Glastonbury quite frequently. And also we have these strange markings and there was obviously some kind of stand they used there. Uh, we're really unclear about what a lot of these were used for. Uh, but San Lorenzo, it's known because it was analysed uh, by Matthew Sterling in the 1950s, but also John Burke more recently, the last 10 years. Um, in the book Seed of Nolly Stone of Plenty, he did a superb analysis of this, and he found that there was lots and lots of stonework still left at San Lorenzo, but it's, it's all been moved and destroyed pretty much now. And he believed that they had a whole aqueduct water system there, which enabled them to get water down from the mountain, and they could, uh, they could you know, put water all over their crops. They had a thriving agricultural area there. And even he believed his research, he, was, he analyzed earth energy scientifically, and he believed that they were using the charge from that movement of water through this stone to actually enhance their seeds and grains. When they then went and planted them, they would get a better yield. And this has been analyzed thoroughly by Burke um, and Kaj Halberg in Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. And I'd just like to say that John Burke actually died this year, and I just want to sort of show my respects to him for his work that he's done. He was a brilliant author and he was part of the BLT research team. And that Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty book is one of the finest books I've ever read on anything to do with the Earth Mysteries subject. Highly recommend it. I then went up to um, Coats of Cocos, which is, excuse that photo. Um, I went up to Coats of Cocos on the Gulf Coast. This is the most southern part of the Gulf Coast uh, in this area, kind of here. And this is where I only went, there's nothing left there, it's an, it's an oil town, the whole Gulf Coast is like a whole oil area. Um, and, yeah. and this is actually the beach where Quetzalcoatl was, Quetzalcoatl was said to have left the country. 
In some, some traditions, he spent 20 years in Mexico teaching all the different tribes and cultures, all these arts and sciences we've looked at. And then he got driven out by a dark god who wanted to bring back sacrificing and the old ways before Quetzalcoatl got there because he was against sacrificing. It was one of his main agendas was to remove that uh, from the land. Um, and so he was driven out, it was driven out by the dark god. Uh, and this is where he was said to have left on Quetzalcoatl on a raft of serpents. And interestingly, Quetzalcoatl means serpent sanctuary. Um, so this whole raft of serpents thing is very odd. This is the whole kind of serpent symbolism we're dealing with here. And there's a whole global prehistoric culture that used, had, had this serpent symbolism involved with them, including, obviously, Viracocha in South America. So the next stop was La Venta. And this is supposed to be one of the, one of the later, slightly later Olmec capitals to San Lorenzo. Uh, this is the pyramid they built there. And you can see it's pretty big. Um, it's bigger than Silbury Hill, for instance, if you want to get some kind of idea of that. This is the layout of the site. A very interesting layout. This is seven sort of seven fluted cone pyramid here. Uh, it was all built up around a kind of swamp, so it was all surrounded by water like a moat. Very unusual mosaics discovered here and here and there. And uh, there's megaliths. There was all this very strange. I went there twice to check this out and it kind of blew me away. This is one of the, again, the sort of African looking heads. Um, this is very interesting. This really blew people away when this was discovered because from 1600 BC, there's evidence of the wheel being used in Central America. Um, this was, this is, it's only a toy. This is like, it looks like it's a kid's toy on the top right, on the top right there. And um, so it's evidence they knew about the concept of the wheel, even if they didn't actually use it themselves. It seems like they had some other high technology which enabled them to do their work. Again, this is in Leventa. These are two more heads. This is number 18 and 19 that have been discovered, uh, but they're so mutilated and so battered that they're barely recognizable. Huge, great megalithic uh, stone here. There's lots of these at Leventa and, and in the Olmec world. When you're in Jalapa Museum, for instance, you, they, they have the oldest, oldest sort of uh, civilizations at, the, at the, the entrance end. So everything's massive. It's all Olmec. It's like huge megalithic stuff everywhere you look. As you walk down to the later eras, everything just gets gradually smaller until it gets tiny to about 600 years ago. And so you see that the high technology of moving these super huge stones was known and it was gradually lost in this part of the world. Again, this is Leventa. These are just re reconstructed heads made of fiberglass. This is the central plaza. This is all these columns uh, that have all been broken now. These are all basalt. These were moved from several miles away. And this is sort of how, how it was laid out, although they would have all been standing in a tight circle of columns, like a sort of, almost like sort of wood hinges, like the sort of tight timber circle, but with these basalt columns. A lot of the, um, most of Leventa, most of the, the stones and the heads were moved to a place called Leventa Park. Um, and uh, this is where some of the mosaics were saved, some of the, the Olmec oid kind of um, figures were saved. And this is just a reconstruction of how, strangely, these mosaics were built very deep. It kind of looks like they're trying to build a swimming pool to me, but that might not be the case. And this just shows you on site the pyramid. Uh, it's a very wet and windy day, but I still did it. This is the strange kind of, again, we see, keep seeing this Egyptian looking stones everywhere you look. These are, yeah, this is on the other side of the pyramid, another Olmec head and altar back in the woods there. And uh, Leventa seems to be, you know, on this great energy line as well, this rainbow serpent uh, that also goes through Lake Titicaca. And obviously this is the extension of the, the Michael line that goes, they meet at Lake Titicaca. So this is Leventa Park. This is where a lot of the stones got moved to. Uh, this is my sort of similarities are ridiculous. Uh, this is an unfinished head. You can see like you can see so you can see some kind of technique of how they were constructing these things. This is a very strange kind of demonic looking feature. This is the smiley one uh, that we saw earlier. This is a reconstructed one. Leventa Park's very interesting. It's in Villahermosa town, which is the main oil town on the Gulf Coast. It's definitely worth a look. They've got a zoo in there as well, if you like animals. Uh, here's the Flying Man. He's quite famous, he kind of points at everyone. Um, he's in a, quite a few different Olmec things. Uh, this is the sort of more Mayan looking sort of figurine and headdress. Looks like he's being greeted by a bearded fellow here, carrying what looks like a rifle. Um, so there's lots and lots of strange carvings the more you look at these. This is what, what they used as tombs, these basalt columns to construct their tombs. 
This is one of the more, more battered Olmec heads. This has been compared to the, the face on the Sphinx by various people. It's got, if you look at the profile of this, it's uh, remarkably similar. This is again a close up of uh, the Olmec kind of um, uh, shaman emerging from the cave. Uh, you can see this here is actually the extension of this goddess's or woman's arm, which turns into a serpent. And it's like it's holding a serpent against the ground. And here we can see four serpents come in from different places. So again, the serpent symbolism was very rife uh, with the Olmecs. This is the Olme one of the main Olmec heads at Laventa Park. It was obviously at Laventa site itself before it got moved in the 1950s. So we're going to move down from the Gulf Coast. You've had a quick Olmec kind of download there. Uh, we di I didn't get to Chapa de Corsa because there's nothing really left there. So we went down to Izapa. Uh, via Palenque and a few other places. Uh, I was quite interested in this place because I'd read, read all the work of John Major Jenkins. Um, and there seems to be a Mayan kind of Olmec crossover here where the Olmecs looked like they were kind of starting to teach the Mayans uh, what they became famous for. This is just some phallic stone there. These are some of the amazing carvings. And here we keep getting this kind of uh, serpent or some people, there's lots of frog figurines as well we'll look at. Uh, Jenkins believes that um, a lot of these, a lot of these symbols that are on and, and carvings on the stones at Izapa show galactic alignment in 2012, and he's written several books about this. It's highly recommended. What interests me about this place is uh, these sort of psilocybin mushrooms and these Bufo marinus toads. As Paul Devereux mentioned once or twice yesterday, uh, they were obviously a highly psychedelic culture, so much so that they were carving them into stones. Psilocybin is the same stuff you get in the magic mushrooms in Britain. Bufo marinus toads, you get 5-MeO-DMT from their shoulders, and if you extract it in the correct way and smoke it, you have the most powerful psychedelic experience known on Earth. Not that I've done that, of course. <laughs> and here is some of the beautiful stonework in the Azapa Museum, which is in the, the nearby town of Tapachula. And we moved into Guatemala, over the border, to the most dangerous town in Central America, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, and this is a place called El Baal, and we had three uh, guards. They didn't have guns on them, unfortunately, but we, we got away safe. Uh, and they took us to these sites, and this is El Baal. Again, you see this sort of very Phoenician, Egyptian-looking kind of stonework here. The dating on this is quite interesting. Officially, it's a few hundred BC, but there's a lot of evidence that it's much, much older because not much work has been done here. And in the sense, so there's not much funding for archaeology in, uh, in, in Guatemala unless it's Mayan which is a little bit prejudiced to me. These are some of the stones out in a field called Bilbao, just, ran, just not, far from, um, not far from El Bao. These are just left in a sugar cane field. Uh, apparently everyone on the street there carries guns um, if you go there, so be careful. Uh, and these are great big figurines. I've got a better photo of this that's in the museum. This was another one. These, these, when you see the carvings in a moment, you'll see the sort of, there's really beautiful carvings on this stunning piece of work, very similar to some of the Olmec stuff. This is one they just discovered the week before we got there. I don't know if we can claim anything on that, Jacqueline. Um, but that's obviously Jacqueline. Um, but there's a face there, eye there, earlobe there, and there's a lot of other stuff going on. You can't see it clearly in that photo, but I'm sure that will be excavated soon. This is another stone just out in the field at Bilbao. You can see the beautiful stonework. Again, quite unique, very Olmecoid. Here's some other strange faces here with tongues or something sticking out of their mouth. Uh, again, great megaliths. Outside, this is just, they call it a finca, it's just a little um, museum basically. You have to find the local guy with the key to get in, but we did that. <coughs> Here we get the strange Olmecoid heads. This is all in the El Bao Bilbao area of great big megalithic chunks outside the, the church. And again, we get the psilocybin mushrooms and the little spheres. So we know that there was definitely some kind of um, psychedelic fun being had by that lot. Double serpent symbolism, this really interests me, especially with the earth energies research that I've been doing and, um, and me and Sean have been working on over the years. And they're sort of coming together here. It's like an Ouroboros almost as well. This is the, a replica of the stone we just looked at. And you can see the detail of the stonework is rather incredible. And here's just another selection of the stones from uh, the Bilbao uh, small museum there. It's a fascinating place. There's so much of this kind of stuff in, in Central America, in the Gulf Coast, in uh, southern Guatemala, Izapa, which is just in Mexico over the border from Guatemala. Um, it's really worth uh, spending a bit of time down that way and exploring. Be careful around this area, especially.
And this is, we then moved to a small town called La Democratia. Uh, these, all place, these all came from a site that's now been destroyed called Monte Alto. Uh, and these are again, Olmecoid heads, very strange looking heads. And there's a few seated kind of Buddha figurines. But they seem to be wearing shades for some reason, uh, or they're wearing some kind of spectacles. Definitely, they're definitely wearing something on their eyes. Uh, you can see that quite clearly. You can see, even see the bit going across there. Yeah? I mean, it's very clear. And this is like several hundred BC officially, although we know that the other Olmec heads are uh, one and a half thousand BC at least. But yeah, these are just in the main plaza at La Democracia. They're very big. You know, you can see the size of them. Uh, strange seated Buddha-type figures. There's quite a few of these in southern Guatemala. Uh, not quite the same as the Olmec stuff. There's a whole different style and design to a lot of these, uh, a lot of these rock carvings, but very megalithic nonetheless, as you can see by the sheer magnitude of them. And you can see the sort of intriguing look on his face. He looks very pleased about something. And even on the border into Honduras, just south of here, on, on our way to Capan, uh, we found the Bufo Marinas toad um, you know, on a border. Uh, which is quite interesting. It's got DMT potentially on his shoulders. Um, and also these strange lion figurines, which occur quite frequently at these South Guatemalan sites. There's, there's quite, a few of the, quite a few exact same, like for example, there's two of these, and some of the statues, there's two of them. There's always one, there's always two, or sometimes even four of the same one. We, I did notice this in a few of the Southern Guatemalan sites. Um, and this is uh, something that I keep, I keep we kept finding throughout Central America and all around the world, apparently. It just says, may peace prevail on Earth in four different, um, different languages on each side. And you get the, you get, there's a group going around the world planting these and cementing them in the ground, which is rather, rather sweet, I think. So we had a quick look at Kapan, but I'm not going to go into that here because uh, it doesn't, it's not really a, potentially a megalithic site. There's some interesting carvings there. Uh, but I wanted to move on to Carigua, which is again in southern Guatemala, further east towards Belize. Uh, and here is a very interesting site because we're looking at pretty much the hugest, biggest megaliths uh, in the whole of Central America, even bigger than some of the uh, Olmec stuff. And here, this is one of the strange uh, anamorph figures. Uh, which is the present at the site. Uh, I've got this strange orb on my camera, which I hadn't had any orbs before this one. This is the first one that came. I don't, I don't use a standard camera, I use a video camera to take my shots. So I was very pleased that that popped up. I'm not sure what that is or what it means. However, to me, I didn't know this. I've looked at lots of photos of Kuriko and I sort of planned, I did a bit of research before I went there. However, look, there's three huge stones underneath it. Now, I don't know if this was originally like this, uh, to me, if you were to remove the carving and put them stones in a slightly different configuration, you'd have a classic dolmen. Uh, yeah, it's quite clearly you can see that. And there's, there's several, of these, several of these on site. So whether these were there much earlier, we don't know. Again here, this is another one, three huge stones underneath this zoomorph anamorph figure. These are the largest stelae, the largest, tallest stones in Central America. They're, some of them are up to 36 or 37 feet tall. Um, they're beautifully carved out of hard sandstone. Quite worn now. And then at the back, I got a bit excited, as you can see in this photo, but at the back of the site there, uh, I, didn't, I hadn't seen this in any photos. I'd only seen photos of the stelae and the zoomorph figures, or the anamorph figures got back there and suddenly I find this huge megalithic kind of construction which is part of the whole kind of temple complex there. I found these sort of several, you know, probably five to ten ton stones, perfectly cut, placed together, you can't fit a card between them, similar style again to Egypt and South America. And again you can see the polygonal walls even, the way they're placing these together in perfect configurations and even strange toes coming out of them as well. Uh, which I thought was very interesting. And as we move into uh, central Belize, I, don't, I think I've got the slides here for that, uh, you, get, you find a very similar style at Luban Tomb and Nimli Punit. Luban Tomb is where the crystal skull was discovered. And when I was at Carigua, I had a chance meeting with this guy, um, and I kind of was asking him if he could give me a lift to Guatemala City, because otherwise I would have been stranded. And he basically let me stay at his family's home. And then he took me to his uh, sort of garage area and pulled out all these artifacts that he'd found. And I was very pleasantly surprised. And interestingly, uh, that looks particularly Olmec. 
or uh, Izarpan style. This is very interesting, and there's about 30 of these artifacts. I just took a photo of the, showing you the main ones here. And this one here, as we'll see, looks just like some of the larger uh, stone heads that were found at a place called Abaj Takalik, which is um, just over into Guatemala near the Mexico border in, at the south area. And some of his uh, pendants and smaller pieces look particularly Olmec as well, which is, I found very interesting. The Guatemala City Museum, there's lots of interesting stuff there. Uh, this site here, Camin Jiua, if that's correct. Uh, but they, they date this in the museum at 2500 BC, so we're going even beyond uh, the Olmec era when we're looking at southern Guatemala. So all this stuff we've looked at at El Bao, Bilbao, and all these other sites could be 2,500 to 3,000 BC. And again, we get this, the psilocybin mushroom, we get the bufo marinas toad, we get the dude with, with shades on, uh, we get the seated Buddha figures, we get these beautiful carvings, really well done. Um, it, Guatemala City Museum is awesome and it's really worth, uh, really worth checking it out if you're there, if you're interested in the Mayan stuff as well, of course. Uh, again, um, either a strange uh, crash helmet or a mushroom on his head. Uh, again, strange eyepieces, glasses, shades, uh, seated figures, some of the stele. There's so much stuff in this museum, you really have to explore it thoroughly yourself. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of the key pieces there relating to my research. And then um, this is uh, just around this area, just over the border here. That's, uh, I think, late Attic land. Around this area, that's, that's the place, uh, that's the sort of uh, site near in Guatemala City where all these pieces were found. Here is a place called um, Abash Takalik. It was a very, very hot day I was there. I can barely cope with the heat that day. Uh, I can barely cope with the cold here today. Um, these are the, some strange chambers that I found there, and these look particularly sort of Irish or uh, from Cornwall or even New England, showing megalithic kind of construction again. This is, the, this is like the smoking gun of the Olmecs. This is yet another Olmec head, the only one that's been discovered that looks anywhere near like the ones on the Gulf Coast in, uh, further south than there, and this is down in southern Guatemala. You can clearly see the ear there. You can see the shape of the helmet, and the archaeologist guy, and there's a lips there, a nose there. There's not much left of it, but it might look thin to you, but most of the helmet heads are quite thin if you look at it on profile. Uh, so this does fit in, and this is pretty much the same size as some of the smaller Olmec heads. So it's, it's proof, it's like the smoking gun that the Olmecs were moving south, they were diffus a diffusion going into the southern parts of Central America, and possibly into Belize. It just shows you some of the other sort of strange stonework, again heads. This is a, a larger uh, stone that, that, that my chance meeting with that guy in Carigua, the small one he was holding is an almost exact replica of this one found in a similar area in southern Guatemala. Uh, strange crocodile features at the base of some of the pyramids at Abaj Takalik, Stele. Oh, I have got the Copan images in. I just have to flick through these ones swiftly. Uh, but this is a sort of, uh, again, this is like the same kind of culture, but there's evidence here of Orientals even being here as well. And you do get some interesting megalithic stonework, like a sort of uh, otherworldly seat. Uh, very interesting carvings here and stones. Very powerful energy here as well, if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. And that, rain, that plume serpent energy line we looked at earlier goes through this site too. Uh, strange third eye carving on this old McCoyd head. And again, the beautiful stele there, which um, are similar to those at Carigua. And there's actually quite a lot of um, battles, apparently, between Carigua and Copan around 700 AD. These are just some, uh, some of the stones uh, you get at some other sites. This is a place called Kalak Mul. Just wanted to show you the sheer size of some of the stele here and the way the trees are hugging the stones, a bit like us Glastafarians do frequently. This is a place in Belize called Seros. This is northern Belize. I just wanted to show you this because of the Olmec features on the stucco carvings here, the stucco kind of um, shapes and carvings, and also an uh, Olmecoid pendant that was found there. So we can see that even right up to northern Belize, there's evidence uh, of the Olmecs, or ev certainly, uh, certainly um, they were inspired by it, or something along those lines. This is the guy called Jim that I met in northern Belize. He's an explorer. Uh, you know, he's like a professional explorer, does it for a living. Uh, these are, this is some wooden piece he found in the, the Mayan mountains, just, in, just near the Guatemala border with Belize. 
Here he is with Anna Mitchell Hedges. He used to live with her with the, the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. And he's got, all, he's got the whole inside story on that, which um, I can let you know if you meet me outside. And again, in Belize, just further south of there, it's a place called Lamini. And this has just been uncovered, this one. And it's a clear Olmecoid head. And it's about the same size, but this is stucco, so it's been shaped and kind of, you know, carved, not carved as such, just sort of pieced together with stucco like cement. This is just the pyramid that it was on. But again, we see the diffusion seems to be going throughout Central America. And so if we move further south, right down south in Belize, near a place called Punta Gorda, is the famous Luban tomb, where the, the, the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull was discovered. But what really interested me here was the whole polygonal stonework here, which Gary Biltcliffe's uh, very into, and I, I wanted to show him these, but I don't think he's here today. Uh, and you can see here, and these are, these are huge megalithic blocks. We're talking five to 15 tons here. Uh, they're obviously, they, you know, this isn't the standard Mayan design. Uh, similar to Carigua as well. So we think there may have been some culture down there, uh, several hundred, if not a thousand BC. Um, and we know that southern Guatemala, uh, with that place near in Guatemala City, is two and a half thousand BC at least. So there's a lot to consider in that part of the world. Again, the crystal skulls that were discovered here. We have this strange spaceman with a crash helmet. It's just like about this big, tiny little piece. Boxing gloves, strange skirt. This guy here wearing the glasses again. So there's a lot of these things that really haven't been analyzed, researched, or documented just yet. Nimli Punit, it's just down the road from uh, Lubantu. Again, it's hugely megalithic site. You get the largest stele in Belize. This one here is 35 foot tall. This is my Mayan friend who was showing me around. I stayed at his Mayan family's home, which is very pleasant. These are some of the megalithic blocks in the stairway. So we can see that there's clearly a megalithic culture going back throughout Central America. So I've just given you a brief outline of some of the places that, that we visited. And it just proves to me that there is some, something going on there that hasn't been looked at thoroughly. The only person I know who's, who's done a good book about this is David Hatcher Childress. He's really covered it effectively about the Olmecs. But with the calendar evidence here and the evidence of perhaps that Quetzalcoatl was actually a person and not a legend, as, as most people think, um, suggests that, that this is definitely worth looking at, again, from a megalithic perspective. This is why I felt it was um, appropriate for me to stand in for Sean here and do this. And this is just uh, going to finish up here on time, which is good. Um, this is the carving from Takar that was actually um, that's in the northern highlands of Guatemala, which is one of my favourite places on earth. And this is a carving that was removed in the 1930s and taken to the, the Berlin Museum. And it's one of the only pieces of evidence that there was some kind of uh, ancient destruction in antiquity. And this is what a lot of people believe Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha and all these other groups of these so-called white gods came from. That they came to this land from another place because their land got destroyed. And this, is the only, this was the only evidence in stone of that kind of thing happening. Uh, the problem is this actually got ironically destroyed itself in the Berlin Museum when it was bombed in the Second World War. Um, so it's quite unfortunate, but at least there's photographs and uh, illustrations of it. And with Obviously, with 2012 fast approaching, it really is good for, from, uh, from my perspective, from the ancestors and the ancient perspective, to know where we've come from, especially as the Mayan calendar or the Olmec calendar ends on December the 21st, 2012. It's worth having another look at what they were doing back then so we get some idea of what we were doing back then so we have an understanding of who we are now. And uh, on the other hand, it could be just as simple as this. So thank you very much. Cheers.